all know that there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and what? And John. But did you know there's a fifth Gospel? And that's sometimes called the Gospel according to God, Isaiah chapter 53. Some of the early church fathers actually referred to Isaiah 53 as the fifth Gospel. And it so graphically describes the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, the exaltation, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that it's been called a fifth gospel. Now, it is found in Isaiah chapter 53 and is known as the Song of the Suffering Servant. It's the last of four prophetic songs or poems. So there's four separate songs about Jesus the Messiah in the book of Isaiah. They're in chapter 42, chapter 49, chapter 50, and here in chapter 53. They say, well, pastor, how do you know that Isaiah 53 is about Jesus? Well, the Bible actually says in Acts chapter 8 that a man from Ethiopia, who was a eunuch, had gone to Jerusalem to find God, and he went away dejected and discouraged. He didn't find God. But he got the Word of God. He got the book of Isaiah. And he was out riding in his chariot going back to Ethiopia. And God spoke to Philip, the evangelist, and said, see that chariot? Go join yourself to that chariot. So he ran. And when he got near the chariot, he heard the Ethiopian reading the scroll. Guess what he was reading? Isaiah 53. And the text in the book of Acts says he was reading verses 7 and 8. And so he asked the Ethiopian, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guide me? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? Come on up in my chariot. And so he climbs up in the chariot. And the Bible says from that verse that Philip preached unto him Jesus. I love that. From that very verse in Isaiah, Philip preached Jesus Christ. Did you know that all the Bible is about Jesus Christ? That he is the center theme and focus of the scriptures. In the Old Testament, we have his anticipation of Christ. In the Gospels, we have his incarnation of Christ. In the book of Acts, we have the proclamation of Christ. In the epistles, we have the explanation of Christ. And in the revelation, we have the glorification of Christ. So all through the Bible, it's all about Jesus Christ. If you're reading your Bible and you don't find Jesus Christ, you're not reading the Bible correctly, Jesus said, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have life, but they, that is the scriptures, testify of me. But he said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you refuse to come to me that you might have life. So the Bible is to direct us to Jesus Christ. He's the central theme. And I believe that that Isaiah chapter 53 is all about Jesus, the Messiah. Now, the greatness of of Isaiah 53 is not easy to describe. It's one of the greatest chapters of the Bible. And it's interesting that all of the verses in Isaiah 53 are quoted somewhere in the New Testament. It's the most quoted Old Testament chapter in all the New Testament. So it's something that's central to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's been called the Mount Everest of Old Testament prophecy. It's a song of the suffering servant. And I want to explain it. It has five stanzas. It's a song or a poem. It has five stanzas. Each stanza has three verses. So it's all broken down into five sections. And it has a theme. And each has three verses. So what I want to do this morning is I want to share with you the descriptions of Jesus the suffering servant, five of them, if you're taking notes, that are taken from these five stanzas. Now, the first one, if you're taking notes, is that he is the sovereign servant. He's the sovereign servant. Now, for this, you have to back up into Isaiah chapter 52, and it starts at verse 13. It says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. That is his exaltation or his sovereignty. As many were astonished at thee, his visage, 
was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So he sprinkles many nations and the kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which he hath not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Now we could spend weeks on each one of these stanzas. So it's kind of a challenge to overview this whole prophecy in one sermon. Now you say, well, John, why did you back up into chapter 52 if the prophecy is in Isaiah 53? Well, the chapter verse divisions in your Bible are not in the original scriptures. They were imposed on the scriptures for easy reference so we can find scriptures, chapters, verses. So the prophecy begins not in 53.1, but in 52.13. So verse 13, 14, and 15 of chapter 52 is the first stanza of this prophecy of the suffering servant. And what is the theme? His exaltation. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. That means he shall govern wisely. He shall succeed. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Then it goes on to mention his humility and what the Jews will say at his second coming in verse 15. But the first stanza exalts his sovereignty. Now, whenever we think of Jesus, we need to remember who he is. He is the second person of the Godhead. When I say Godhead, the Bible teaches there's one God but he is manifest in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We go, well, don't you have three gods? No, one God, one in essence, one divine being, but three persons. You say, well, I don't understand. I go, yeah, isn't it awesome? If God were small enough for my brain, he wouldn't be big enough for my needs. I'm glad that God is transcendent. He's high and holy. So he's the thrice holy God, holy Father, holy Son, and Holy Spirit. So the second person of the Godhead, God the Son, came from heaven and was born coming through the womb of a virgin. Her name was Mary. We celebrate his first advent at Christmas time. So who is Jesus? He is the sovereign God manifested in the flesh. He is God in human flesh. He's fully man and fully God. He is the true man, true God in one person. So he's the sovereign. So when we take communion, we break the bread, we drink the cup, we need to remember that he's the sovereign one. Now the second strophe or section is in chapter 53 verses 1 to 3, and that is he is the scorned servant. So there's all these pictures in each strophe about Jesus. The first is that he's sovereign, he'll be extolled and lifted up. By the way, great parallel passage is Philippians chapter 2, that he humbled himself, took on him the form of a servant, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has what? Highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So his humiliation led to his exaltation. So his crucifixion and his resurrection and exaltation. But notice that he was rejected by man. Verse 1 of chapter 53 Who shall believe our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The word arm of the Lord refers to his miraculous power demonstrated by Christ's miracles. For he shall grow up. And so we have really his ministry. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness when we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. Nothing physically attractive about Jesus. He didn't glow in the dark. He didn't have a halo. He didn't have long, flowing, beautiful hair and a surfer tan and perfect teeth. You say, are you capping on Jesus? No. But I'm telling you that he was just a normal guy. You couldn't pick him out in the crowd. When they went to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, they had to have Judas kiss him to know who he was. Otherwise, you could have said, get the guy with the halo. Just look for the guy that's glowing in the dark. Look for the guy whose voice has reverb in it. No, he was a normal human being. No comeliness that we would desire of him. And he is despised, verse 3, 
He is rejected of men. The word men there, lest I forget, means the elite, the aristocrats, the high uppers. He's a man of sorrows. I love that title for Jesus Christ. He's acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now notice the verbs are all in the past tense. I didn't mention it second service and I should have, but all of this prophecy about Jesus is going to be quoted by Jews when they see him come back in his second coming. And I challenge you to read Isaiah 53 with that in mind, that these are Jews at the second coming who will be saying that we, we missed him, we crucified him. He bore our sorrows, he carried our grief. And what a horrible thing that will be for them at that time, even though there'll be salvation for Israel at that time. So notice verses 1 to 3, that he will be scorned, he will despise, and he will be rejected. Now, who hath believed our report, verse 1, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Paul used that in the, in the book of Romans to talk about the preaching of the cross and the preaching of the message that men rejected. But obviously the Jews rejected him at his first advent. The Bible says in John's gospel that he came to his own, the word own there means own world, own created world, and his own, that is his own Jewish people, received him not. But whoever do, does receive him, to them, he gives the power, the right, the authority to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So the message is not believed, even though they see, verse 1, the arm of the Lord revealed. They saw his miracles, they saw his healings, he saw, they saw his power, but they would not believe. And then his humiliation, verse 2, he shall grow up as a tender plant. This is what's called a sucker branch. You ever have a tree, and at the base of the tree, little branches start to come out? You have to cut them off, right? You lop them off. So it's like just no importance, insignificant, cut them off. And he shall be like a root and dry ground. No form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire of him. In Mark chapter 6, they looked at him and said, is not this the carpenter's son? They couldn't believe what was going on. Isn't this just the carpenter's son? Is he not from Galilee and from the city of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So he's despised, verse 3, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You know, the Bible never says Jesus laughed. I believe he probably laughed, but it doesn't tell us he laughed. And there's nothing wrong with laughter, there's nothing wrong with humor. I've had people criticize me. You, you, you use too much humor. And my response is, if you knew how much I held back, you'd give me some credit. <laughs> I think Jesus actually used humor. But he was also a man of sorrows because he knew that he would be rejected. He knew that he would be crucified. He looked over Jerusalem and he wept tears. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you stoned the prophets. You killed those who were sent to you. How often I would have gathered you as a mother hen would gather her chickens and you would not. So he was acquainted with grief. He, he felt the pain because he had so much knowledge about man's spiritual rebellion and sin and the consequences that were coming upon this nation of Israel. But he was despised and we esteemed him not. So he is the scorned servant, his rejection and humiliation. Number three is verse six, four to six, excuse me, verse four to six. He's the substitutionary servant. Now this is the heart of Isaiah's servant song, verse four. Surely he, that is Jesus, hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Note the reference to our Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, verse 5. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Because all we like sheep, verse 6, have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity 
of us all. If we didn't have any of the Gospels or any of the epistles, we could still have the Gospel clearly explained in the prophecy of Isaiah 53. He's carried our sorrows. He's borne our griefs. He died in our place so that he could justify us and forgive us of our sins. Now, notice he was stricken, verse 4, and smitten of God and afflicted. So God's judgment came upon God's own son at the cross. Then he was wounded for our transgressions. The word transgressions, verse 5, means to willfully, deliberately step over the line. The word in its etymology literally means to step over, cross over the line. So it's referring to a willful, deliberate act of disobedience. God says, thou shalt not. And we say, you can't tell me what to do. And defiantly, we break God's commandment or God's laws. Then the word iniquities is a different word for our sins. And that literally in its etymology means to be bent or twisted. You know, sometimes we'll use these things as a figure of speech. You're out of bounds, dude. You ever heard that? You're out of bounds. You stepped over the line. So that's what we do with God's word. We disobey it. And then we are twisted. We'll say, man, that dude's bent or that dude's tweaked or he's really messed up. So it speaks of our disobedience to God's word and our sinful nature that is corrupt or twisted in which it manifests in rebellion toward God. So he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised, which is his punishment for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed. So notice that he was wounded, he was bruised, he was chastised, and he received stripes. With his stripes we are healed. Now I don't like to get into controversial subjects when I'm supposed to be preaching a communion sermon, but I do want to mention that this verse, by his stripes we are healed, is often misinterpreted. And there's a tendency to not want to deal with it because it's a sensitive issue, but I think it needs to be clarified. There are those that are sometimes called the positive confession, health and wealth, prosperity, word, faith teachers that use this verse to teach that if you're a Christian, you've already been healed. That if you have symptoms, it's because you don't have enough faith to believe that in the cross, Jesus died for your physical healing. I totally disagree with that interpretation, the cut to the chase. When he says, by his stripes we are healed, he's not talking about physical healing. He's talking about forgiveness of sins. Now, will our bodies be healed someday? Yes, but not until we die and go to heaven and we get a resurrected body or we're raptured and our bodies are metamorphosized or changed and we have a resurrection body. So I don't believe that healing is in the atonement in this sense, that if you are a Christian, you should be healed if you just have enough faith and believe God. They also carry it over to health and then wealth, that if you're a Christian, not only are you healed, but you should be rich. Every Christian should have lots of money. Every Christian should have lots of things and possessions because we're king's kids. So they have the health and wealth gospel, and they use this verse, and they misinterpret it. I want you to write down this passage. It's so important. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Who in his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. That's his cross. That we being dead to sins would live under righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Notice in that verse, he's clearly talking about our sins. And in Isaiah, he's clearly talking about our sins. Now, does God heal? Yes, he heals. Should we pray for God to heal us? Yes, we should. But God's not obligated to heal us based on the cross of Jesus Christ. God will heal you basically because that's his plan and his purpose. And he shows you mercy but we're all going to someday get sick and die. Do I get an amen? So I don't care how much faith you have. I don't care how positive you are. I don't care how much you psych yourself up and you confess it with your mouth. You will eventually go the way of all flesh. 
And you won't have a healed body perfectly until you're in heaven in your glorified body. And what a glorious day that will be. So don't misinterpret it by his stripes. We're healed as though it's carte blanche in the atonement. That we're automatically healed by the death of Jesus Christ physically. And then he talks about our sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. What a picture that is. We are like sheep and we go astray. Sheep are not smart animals. Sheep, although they're kind of cool looking, are very dumb. Not very flattering that God likens us unto sheep, right? They are weak, they're helpless, they're defenseless, and they have no sense of direction. We turn to our own way, but the Lord laid on him, that is Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Now, this is what's called the substitutionary servant or the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. This is the heart and the center focus of the prophecy. If you don't understand the substitutionary nature of the cross, you don't understand the cross of Jesus Christ. Write down 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul says these words. He says, For he made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Now there's only one person on that list who knew no sin. Who is it? Jesus Christ. So he was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made what? The righteousness of God in him. So 2 Corinthians 5.21 is one of the clearest references to the substitute that took place. Jesus took my place on the cross. When you think about the death of Christ on the cross, you have to remember, he died in my place. I should have paid for my sins. And the wages of sin is death. But he died in my place so that I could have eternal life and I could be freely forgiven. So the death of Jesus Christ was a substitute. Remember when God told Abraham to offer his son Isaac on an altar of Mount Moriah? And he lifted the knife. He was going to plunge it into his son to be obedient to God. And God stopped him. God never intended him to kill his own son, even though God gave his own son. And he told Abraham, look it over in the bushes. There's a ram. Take that ram, take Isaac off the altar and put that ram in its place and sacrifice that ram. That's substitutionary death. So Jesus was the lamb of God who would carry away the sins of the world. So when we think of the cross, it's not just an example of God's love, an example of sacrifice an example of giving ourselves for others. It's an actual atoning, substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. Now, there's a fourth strophe or movement. It's in verses 7 to 9 of Psalm or Isaiah 53. And here we see the submissive servant. So we have the sovereign servant. We have the scorned servant. We have the substitutionary servant. And then verses 7 to 8, 9, and 9, which is the passage that was read by the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8, we have the submissive servant. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, again describing his suffering. And yet he opened not his mouth. That's hard to do. When I suffer, everyone around me knows about it. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before shears is dumb, he opened not his mouth. He was silent. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he hath cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He has made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he hath done no violence. Notice at the end of verse 9. Speaking of his sinlessness. So we have his silence, his submission, and his sinlessness. Neither was any deceit found in his mouth. This is quoted in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, where Peter says, Being reviled on the cross, he reviled not back. You know, if somebody says something mean to you, what do you usually do? Say something meaner back, right? If someone attacks you, you attack them. But Jesus hanging on the cross was being spit at, mocked, ridiculed. And yet he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. 
So he was our example of not returning evil for evil. But we are to follow in his example. Now, his submissive, as he was tried before Pilate, before Herod, he stood there silent. This speaks of what's called the voluntary nature of Christ's death. So you need to understand that it was substitutionary and it was voluntarily. Sometimes we say it was vicarious. He died in my place. And it was actually voluntary. He did it willingly. Jesus said, no one takes my life. I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it back again. So he willingly gave himself to die on the cross for our sins, our transgressions. Notice that in verse 8. He was stricken. Now he was sinless, verse 9. He had done no violence, neither was any guile found in his mouth. So he was the submissive, sinless son of God. Then the fifth and last strophe or section is verse 10, 11, and 12. The last three verses, he's the saving servant. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and put him to grief. When thou shalt see his soul an offering of sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days and the pleasure of, his, of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul. In other words, he's going to see the fruit of the results of his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And shall be satisfied, notice that, by his knowledge shall many righteous, shall my righteous servant be justifying many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. He died between two thieves. And he bare the sin of many. And he made intercession for the transgressors. As they said, he prayed and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now here's the dominant thought. He was also the saving servant. The saving servant. I want to point out how Jesus saves us on the cross. Number one, in verse 10, he died for our sins or died for our iniquities. It says he made an offering of sin. And then secondly, he rose from the dead. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The first half of verse 10 is about his sacrifice for sin on the cross. The second half is about his resurrection from the dead. So we have his eternal sovereignty in the past. We have his ministry, the arm of the Lord in the present where he was rejected. We have his crucifixion. We have his resurrection. And we have his ascension and exaltation. Then notice verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge, by knowing him, shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So he died for us. He rose for us. And then verse 11, he satisfied the demands of God's holy, righteous law. He actually satisfied. That's called propitiation. Now, the word propitiation means that Jesus died to pay for the law of God that was broken in heaven. So he satisfied the demands of God's holy, righteous wrath and judgment. The law satisfied. And then secondly, he justified, as verse 11, the servant shall justify many. So we have propitiation, we have justification. Justification is the act of God where he declares the believing sinner, only the believing sinner, to be righteous. And the basis he does that is his propitiation, his satisfaction of the law of God that has been broken. Now, God is speaking in verse 12. God is speaking. It's his vindication of Christ's work on the cross. I will, notice verse 12, I will divide him that is Messiah, a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. 
So God says, I am going to exalt him. So in Philippians chapter 2, he being in the very form of God, thought equality with God not something to hold on to, but he emptied himself and took on him the form of a servant and became obedient to death, death of the cross. So what did God do? Highly exalted him. Gave him a name which is above what? Every name. But the name of Jesus, every knee should what? Bow. And every tongue should what? That Jesus Christ is who? Lord, to the glory of God the Father. All that is spelled out for us 680 years before Jesus was ever born in Bethlehem. Don't tell me the Bible isn't the word of God. Only God, who is eternal and omniscient, could have prophesied such detail. He died between two thieves. He made his bed with the rich. Jesus' body would have been thrown into the valley of Hinnom and incinerated. We would have never known if he rose from the dead. But instead he was laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And three days later he did what? He rose from the dead. Amen? And the grave is empty. And sin and death have been conquered through the cross of Jesus Christ. And it all comes back to this. If you want to get to heaven, you can't go around the cross. The only way to get to heaven is through the cross of Jesus Christ. The only way to be forgiven is through the cross of Jesus Christ. The only way to be a child of God is through the cross of Jesus Christ. You don't get there by being good. You don't get there by taking communion. You don't get there by, by getting a Christian haircut, whatever that is. Wearing Christian clothes. You get there by faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, by grace you have been saved. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. Not of works. Lest anyone should what? Boast. So the only boasting that we can give is the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's why Isaac Watts wrote in his famous hymn, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and I pour contempt on all my pride. And I love that stanza when he said, we're the whole realm of nature mine. That we're present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Amen? Let's pray.